Aliens, experiments, assassinations. They're not just conspiracy theories that show up in season two of the Umbrella Academy. They're part of American culture. We are a nation of believers. But the question you might have after watching is, how real was any of it? So we went episode by episode to identify and explain every conspiracy theory reference we could find in the show, and there are a lot. What are you up to? The showrunner Steve Blackman promised us he buried some really deep, so if you see any that we missed, let us know and we'll do another one of these. Until we get to the truth. Okay, right away in the first episode, we start with a conspiratorial bang. You ever heard of Area 51, Roswell? Yep, everyone has, they're huge. But one reason these conspiracy theories have stuck is that shockingly, the government actually confirmed some of it, briefly anyway. So in 1947, a rancher in New Mexico, about 75 miles north of Roswell, drives by the wreck of something in the desert that startles him. It's shiny and out of place. He takes it to the local sheriff, who in turn takes it to the local military base. They gather all the remaining pieces, and this is the extraordinary part, issue a statement to the local paper that the military has taken possession of a flying saucer. Whoa. Whoa. But they retracted that statement the very next day, instead claiming it was just a weather balloon. Tracking anomalies in, in the atmosphere. But the story had already gotten out there, and it continued to grow when tabloids printed the original story, but not the retraction. Suddenly, people claimed that they had seen alien bodies being examined at Roswell. And the rumor spread that the Roswell craft and its occupants had been taken to Area 51, an ultra-secure military facility to be tested and reverse-engineered. To be fair, the place does sort of give off that morally suspect experiment vibe. But the government's behavior has at least one plausible non-alien explanation. I'm a fraud. I've been lying to all of you from the start. Declassified documents have revealed that the weather balloon may have actually been part of Project Mogul, a high-tech, high-altitude spy vessel designed to monitor Soviet nuclear tests. It was extremely sensitive, so that's why the government was keen to say basically anything but the truth, including aliens. Is the truth out there? Well, this one's hard, but we have every reason to believe this picture is accurate, and it looks like a balloon? So Roswell is maybe a little overblown. So maybe I'm reading too much into it, but there's a very sinister milk vibe that starts in the first episode and really picks up in the second. Not only do the Swedish assassins drive around in a milk truck and wear milkman outfits and gulp down bottles of dairy, but there are a couple of strangely prominent shots of cows during the season when characters are being threatened. Hmm. Maybe, hear me out, all of this is the show's nod to a sinister milk conspiracy theory that says that Big Dairy has colluded with big government for years to sell us milk we don't need. What's it? Notice how the Swedish milk assassins report to the quasi-governmental commission? One fact the spoiled milk believers point to is the three recommended servings of dairy per day when up to 25% of American adults can't even digest the stuff. And there's the fact that milk is traditionally one of only two drinks allowed on the Senate floor. There's special precedent that allows for it. Finally, milk had a dark past in the Cold War. The CIA came closest to assassinating Fidel Castro with a chocolate milkshake, despite what you may have heard about a cigar. So this one seems pretty plausible. I mean, the USDA, who sets our nutritional guidelines, also made all of those Got Milk ads. Drink carefully. AJ! We're introduced to the inner workings of the commission in the second episode, but it really takes the whole season to grasp their odd mix of tedious bureaucracy and horrible violence. Over the next 90 minutes, I'm gonna do my best to show you around this old place. You and I are gonna have some fun together. The show never uses the words, but the commission shares a lot with the conspiracy theory known as the deep state. I mean, it can see everything. It has goons, but it's kind of boring. It literally fixes timelines so there's absolutely no deviation from its plan. Shame. And it fits well with the formal definition too, which is a shadow institution that governs independent of, and often at cross purposes to, a legitimate democratically elected body. Any questions? 
Before 2017, in our world, deep state was actually a somewhat obscure phrase typically used to talk about nations like Turkey or Egypt, where a strong military not so secretly ran things instead of the civilian government. Now, it's everywhere. Believers say that everything from the coronavirus to a $31,000 taxpayer-funded dining set debacle is evidence of the deep state acting up. And there seem to be more of those believers than not. In a stunning 2018 poll, 74% of Americans said that the deep state was at least probably real. But even skeptics admit some large institutions <laughs> <clears throat> need oversight, lest they become deep statey. Just not all of them. Look, let's just all be thankful the CIA hasn't discovered time travel, okay? Elsewhere in the second episode, the Umbrella Academy kids discovered that their father may, in fact, be the Umbrella Man. Well, if you haven't heard of him, that's okay, because there are so many sub-conspiracies spinning off of the Kennedy assassination that it's hard to keep track. But for more than a decade, the Umbrella Man was a person of interest in the killing. He shows up in the Zapruder film, the real-life equivalent of the Frankel film from the show, near the site of the assassination. He seems formally dressed, especially for a parade on a warm, sunny day. And he raises an umbrella as President Kennedy's motorcade goes by moments before the shooting. Many thought, What the hell else is he doing standing on the grassy knoll, holding an open black umbrella on a sunny day in Dallas, the exact same moment the president gets shot? Was he signaling the shooter? Did the umbrella itself shoot a dart that immobilized Kennedy? There were indeed umbrella weapons in the Cold War. Unlike many other persons of interest in conspiracies, though, <laughs> Authorities got to question the Umbrella Man in public. When he voluntarily stepped forward to appear before a House committee in 1978, his name was Louis Stephen Witt, and he claimed that he only wanted to heckle Kennedy. It's a bit convoluted, but the Umbrella referenced Neville Chamberlain, the Nazi-appeasing British Prime Minister who always carried one, and who Kennedy's father had strongly supported. He even demonstrated that the Umbrella had no weapons. Presidential assassination? It's never been his thing. And it probably wasn't the real Umbrella Man's either. Let him heckle in peace. One big problem with conspiracy theories is that there's this lack of real stuff you can latch onto, but... Holy shit! That's not the case with crop circles like the one Vanya creates in the third episode. These real and kind of beautiful, symmetrical areas of flattened crops are physical proof that something totally weird is happening. And this might blow your mind, but believers say the weirdness of crop circles goes back way farther than I imagined. In 1678, yes, 1678, a woodcut pamphlet called The Mowing Devil told a tale of a bitter lawn cutting negotiation, I don't know, that led to the devil cutting what appears to be a, a pretty good circle in a farmer's crops. Skip forward with me to the 1960s. And there's a more familiar example, the saucer nests of Tully, Australia. A local farmer, believing he had seen a UFO, investigated, and what he found were large circles in the brush, like a flying saucer parking space. In the 1970s, crop circles spread across the globe, although they still seem to be concentrated in southern England. One theory is that aliens, or even human time travelers from a distant future, are leaving these as messages for us to decipher. Others say governments are using lasers and satellites for unknown but nefarious purposes. But the the easiest explanation is that human hoaxers are the real cause. In 1991, two pranksters inspired by Tully admitted that they'd been behind many of England's crop circles just using simple tools, and they allegedly inspired copycats. But it still doesn't necessarily explain all the physical evidence. <laughs> One estimate says there's a new crop circle every night. Something out there is mowing our lawns, people. He's, uh, oh, right here. It's hard to compete with Elliot's succinct explanation of the Majestic 12 in episode four. A secret committee, scientists, military, deep state. No one knows what they really do. Well, basically, yeah. But because I'm getting paid to do this, the Majestic 12 is allegedly a group of scientific and military heavyweights brought together by Harry Truman in the wake of Roswell to investigate and prevent alien incursions. But it wasn't until 1984, when a documentary producer named Jamie Chanderay received an envelope through his mail slot that anyone knew anything about it. That envelope contained film of the documents that authorized the Majestic 12, and it also revealed the 12's identities. They were bigwigs like Dr. Vannevar Bush, former head of the Office of Scientific Research and Development, and Rear Admiral Sidney Sowers, the first head of the CIA. 
But if the Majestic 12 were focused on aliens, then why are they hunting Kennedy in the show? We cannot allow them to get his nose into our business. I've confirmed the motorcade will indeed be turning left on Elm Street. Because this is where the two biggest conspiracy theories of them all, UFOs and the Kennedy assassination, cross over with each other. According to believers, the Majestic 12 brokered an agreement with aliens in the 1950s that allowed for human abductions in exchange for technology that would lead to the stealth bomber. When Kennedy threatened to expose them, even allegedly sending the CIA a memo about aliens a week before his death, he was killed. But as skeptics looked closer, they found problems with Chandere's documents. There were errors in formatting and anachronisms like media instead of press that suggested the documents were forgeries. Oh my God. In its review in 1988, the FBI went so far as to scribble bogus all over it. Harsh. Some still feel that the documents were a campaign of misinformation aimed at Cold War enemies, so maybe there's something here, but on the other hand, they might just prove a recurring motif in season two. Be skeptical of documents that are handed to you. I was desperate to find you a chimp-related conspiracy theory to go along with Pogo's journey to outer space in the fifth episode, but the US government has been uncharacteristically above board on the subject. The first chimp to cross the threshold into space was Ham in early 1961, the strongest of a class of 40 astro chimps. He was followed shortly thereafter by Enos, who actually orbited the Earth, and that was the end of American chimps in space. But while it's not as world-shattering as some of our other examples, there is an on ongoing space monkey conspiracy theory. See, in 2013, Iran announced they had successfully sent a monkey into space as part of their increasingly sophisticated space program. But critics noted that the monkey they showed off in a subsequent press conference didn't resemble the one from before launch. And yeah, it's kind of obvious. So did the monkey die? Did Iran fake it altogether? For its part, Iran just says it used an archival photo of a different monkey for the before shot, but it looks fishy since some of Iran's previous monkey launch attempts were fatal. Or maybe something else happened up there. Has anyone checked to see if the same pogo came back? Dun, dun, dun. Diego is apparently a believer in lizard people. Your boyfriend isn't the nice guy you think he is. Him and his nasty little squad of lizard people are planning to kill Kennedy the day after tomorrow. And maybe the weirdest part is that he's not alone in that. This number is debated, but allegedly 12 million Americans believe that a group of ancient, bloodthirsty, and shape-shifting reptilian humanoids have infiltrated the highest reaches of society with the goal of enslaving humanity. <gasps> To put that in perspective, and these were the first things that popped up, that's the same number who kept a secret fund from their partner or drove stoned in 2018. It's a lot of believers in murderous spacefaring chameleons. And the king of lizard belief is a former BBC sports announcer named David Icke. He quite literally wrote the book on the reptilians in 1988, and to this day, his website is a main resource on the subject. And they also have a web shop. One reason it's such a clever conspiracy is that it plays well with others. Freemasons and the Illuminati both allegedly report into the lizard people. Ike laid out the attributes that lizard people tend to have in human form. Good hearing, reddish hair, light eyes, an interest in space, a sense of being apart from humanity. Wait, so this whole time, is it possible that Reginald was a... <laughs> Of course, believers have used those criteria to out reptilians masquerading as big time politicians and celebrities. I mean, it's objectively crazy. There are obviously no lizard people, but that's exactly what a lizard person would want you to believe. At first, I didn't think much about this exchange on time travel in the sixth episode. Start small, seconds, not decades. But it may be a very clever reference to the Philadelphia Experiment, where the alleged time travel only lasted, you guessed it, seconds. No offense, but I need a bit more time for what I'm trying to accomplish. It should be plural though, because believers say the first Philadelphia experiment happened in July 1943 at the Philadelphia Naval Yard. There, the Navy performed an experiment on a newly commissioned destroyer, the USS Eldridge, that turned its 1,200 ton bulk totally invisible. 
where did she go? But even bigger feats were on the horizon, because in October that year, a blue light was seen engulfing the Eldridge, which then disappeared. It traveled a few seconds back in time to pop up in Norfolk Harbor, where it was allegedly witnessed by a sailor on a troop transport ship. Believers say the experiment had a steep cost. Some sailors were supposedly fused into the hull of the ship. But ironically, there are problems with the theory's timeline. You know time travel is possible. Time travel isn't the problem. In July of 1943, the Eldridge wasn't even commissioned. And in October, records put it in New York while the observing ship was in the mid-Atlantic. But while time travel and men becoming painfully one with the ship probably didn't happen as the 1984 movie would suggest, Go watch it after Umbrella Academy and report back. The Navy was indeed testing out a new technique that made a ship invisible to mines. So semantically, in some fashion, sure, the Philadelphia experiments were partly real. And we all travel through time, you know? I was really hoping you had more than that. The show doesn't drop the codename MKUltra in the eighth episode because all it needs to do is show this, government agents and LSD together. LSD was so integral to the secret, sinister, and widespread CIA program that at one point, America considered buying the entire world's supply of the drug for $240,000. The CIA started MKUltra in 1953 under the leadership of an agency chemist named Sidney Gottlieb. He's since developed this colorful nickname. Believing that communists had deployed mind control techniques or drugs during the Korean War, the CIA set out to counter with a mind control drug of their own. So for more than a decade, they illegally tested drugs like LSD and tortures like electroshock on many unwitting American citizens, from soldiers to the mentally ill to inmates. But if that wasn't enough for you, they also did real supervillain stuff. Not only did they, according to one author, hire former Nazi and Imperial Japanese torturers as consultants, but at a party, Gottlieb himself spiked the drinks of his fellow scientists with LSD, causing the eventual death of one who became depressed and fell out of a window. Probably very wisely, the CIA tried to cover this up, but it came out anyway in newspapers and congressional hearings. This one's very real and very scary, so you can kind of understand why Elliot acts so squirrely. You from the Pentagon? Definitely not. CIA, FBI, KGB. Don't do drugs. At least not when the CIA is offering. In the second to last episode, we start to hear a little of what Reginald cares about. Your interests on the dark side of the moon won't be affected. Dark is a bit inaccurate. There's light there. But there is indeed a far side of the moon. The same face always points away from the Earth because the moon is what's called tidally locked. And this mysterious and tantalizing far side has split moon conspiracy theorists into two main camps. The larger group believes that we faked the moon landing and have never been there. While the farsiders think the government went farther than they said and saw more on the moon than they let on. The godfather of the far side conspiracist is Milton William Cooper, an influential author who is known for his eerily accurate predictions. Cooper believed that Apollo 11 astronauts saw and even filmed an alien base on the far side of the moon, one that was used to refuel giant alien spaceships. Of course, the aliens warned the astronauts to stay away. And even though the US government was well aware of the base, even naming it Luna, they covered it all up and quickly stopped going to the moon. NASA denies these claims. Lest you scoff too hard at this, weird stuff does happen on the far side of the moon. Astronauts have heard strange music emanating from it, but it may have just been radio interference. Given that the Chinese have recently landed on the far side and said nothing though, this might be one prediction that Cooper got wrong. But an alien base on the far side would help prove that Reginald is Oh conspiracy, shamest thou to show thy dangerous brow by night when evils are most free? Great, your dad made you read Shakespeare too, huh? <clears throat> well, we've gathered together most of the references to the alleged aliens and assassins and experiments of the Umbrella Academy's conspiracy-laden second season. Whether you believe it is up to you. Except that Reginald really is a reptilian monster from the far side of the so there was a more earthly but no less strange theory from the 1980s about crop circle creation. Some thought, how do I put this? That vigorously sexual hedgehogs caused them. And if they can do that, who knows what the hedgehogs are capable of?